morning. What a blessing to be back in this side of the world. Um, love your pastor. Love this church. Uh, I don't know if you remember the, from the last time I was here, but I actually grew up kind of in this area. Grew up in Santa Monica when I got saved, moved down here. Uh, went to Bible school, but I surfed all of these beaches way back when. And uh, just good to be back. I haven't had much reason to come back. Um, I, even though I love this part of the world, because the church that and that sent me to Peru in 1983 uh, wasn't long after, a few years after they transitioned, and it no longer exists. In fact, it quit existing fairly quick. So, uh, it which was actually sad, but a good thing because it opened my life up to a whole different world of churches and. Uh, uh, we're thankful for that, but love the opportunity to come back to just familiar area, even though it looks different. Uh, okay, it looks a lot different than it did 40 years ago, but it's still pretty cool. And so uh, thank God, thank God for this church. Uh, as I get into something, I'm going to open up in a few minutes and read a scripture out of uh, Luke chapter 17. You, if you want, you can just hold a finger there. Everybody now has iPhones with that, so um, you can... Just wait. But um, uh, I just wanted to say something. Uh, I saw the video of Danya's uh, message here a few weeks ago. And what a powerful, powerful moment uh, to think about those Christmas boxes and how, you know, that she living in a country where there is persecution, living in a country where Christians uh, just are the minority and uh, to be able to one day go to church and actually get a present, get a toy, and then to hear the rest of the story, you know, of how her dad had wanted a radio so they could listen to Christian radio, and and there happened to have been one in there. Uh, what a blessing those Christmas boxes are. I actually got a kick out of it when she thought the slinky was a bracelet, you know, um, but that's the, just the story. And I, I say that because she told the story of being a child receiving the box. I'll tell the story of being a pastor that gets to give the boxes out. They really work. They really, really work. When we go at Christmas, and for us, Christmas is, it's a little bit different. Now, I, I've been 37 years in Peru, so I feel kind of like the best of two worlds. I've uh, been more time now away from the United States than in the United States. Um, but for us in South America and Peru, Christmas is in summer. We spend Christmas at the beach, New Year's at the beach, and barbecues instead of turkeys and, and things like that. But uh, on a hot summer day to go into a little village, the, uh, this extreme poverty, and see the children gathered at a little church, and be able to be the ones to go and give them that gift. You know, to watch their eyes light up like, really? I get a gift? Really? Me? And, and their name is called out and they get their little box. And the joy they have. Now, I, Danya's parents were a little mean making her take it home without opening it. We let them open it right there. Because I want to see too. I want to see those faces when the kids get that thing and uh, just to open it up and the thrill they get for many of those kids, it's actually the first new toy they've ever received. For many of those kids, it's uh, the first uh, gift that they've get, gotten like that. So um, we just want to say thank you for being a part of that. Now, I'm going to share something that I shared the last time I was here, and it's because your pastor asked me to. Uh, love Aaron, by the way. We do a lot of training. Our churches, we're, we're a church, but we like to say we're a church that helps other churches. Um, we feel that God has called us to be a first world church in a third world nation, which, how, what does that mean? It basically means we just do things the best we can with excellence, with what we have to help to show other churches that it's possible. Because we've had the church now for over 30 years, nobody can tell me it doesn't work. Okay, we've proven that it does work. And now we're actually mentoring other churches uh, with the Church of the Highlands principle. We want to help a thousand churches break a thousand members. Why? Because if there's a thousand churches that grow to a thousand, that's a million new Christians. How many know we can make a difference if we do that? Amen. 
So we uh, have trainers that come down, and your pastor is actually one of our trainers. And just to brag on Pastor Aaron just a little bit, uh, I shouldn't say this because I know it's being recorded and it might get around, but uh, if it gets around, the other guys can just listen and maybe get better because Pastor Aaron is the best. All right, just to let you know, he everybody loves Pastor Aaron. <laughs> Uh, my team absolutely loves him. He's going to Columbia, helping us train some churches there, uh, helping churches get unstuck. We love to tell the churches, and they say, why should I grow? And I say, it's because God loves more than the 50 people in your city that you have in your church, okay? Uh, we can actually get a few more in there that God loves too. And if God loved your city enough to die for it, you should love it enough to reach it for him. So anyway, that's, uh, we. Pastor Aaron does that now. One of the things that we do that we get to do as a missionary and as a church is something we call our wheelchair ministry. And I'm just going to talk about this briefly um, uh, because I didn't study wheelchair ministry when I was in Bible college. I, it was just an itch that nobody was scratching. And the way, the way we got into this ministry was kind of by accident. Um, we had had the opportunity, Johnny Erickson Tata, you may have heard of her, she's a quadriplegic, and somebody, she'd come to Peru and somebody said, would you like to have her speak in your church on Sunday? I said, absolutely. I saw the movie about her life, so to have her actually be there in our church, I thought would be fun, but that was just the beginning of the learning experience when we had to build, for example, a special ramp for her to get up to the platform, and then have her uh, share that morning the message that she gave it was just powerful. It actually woke us up that, God, we've got to actually think there's other people out there that they're, they're usually hidden in back of people's houses. Um, because we found out the poorest of the poor in a third world country are the disabled. And you, they're hidden usually because people are embarrassed because they don't have a wheelchair. They can't afford a wheelchair. A wheelchair can cost $500, and they maybe make $10 a month. Uh, so they could never dream of it. Uh, they live at the mercy of a parent or a neighbor or a family member that carries them, picks them up, has to bathe them and move them around. And uh, anyway, Johnny Erickson, she told me at the end of the service, I have a container. We're having trouble getting it out of customs. Can you help us? And I said, yes, we can. We actually have a, an ability to help things get out of customs. And so she said, uh, and because I won't be around long enough, can you pass those chairs out for me? I asked her, I said, how many are there? She said, 400. And I'm going, 400? Where am I going to give away 400 wheelchairs? I'll never forget the look on her face. She goes, oh, you'll find them. And she smiled. She just said, you'll find them. And I said, okay, we'll do it. I, somebody in our church said, well, there's a, a poor town, a shanty town just south of Lima. And maybe they, you could find some people there. There's a lot of disabled people in that neighborhood, they've told us. And maybe we can go there and pass out some wheelchairs. So we did what missionaries do. We put a little speaker on the top of the car and drove around that little area of the city saying, hey, if you know somebody that needs a free wheelchair, come out to the park on Saturday morning. We're going to give away wheelchairs to everybody that needs a chair. Everyone that needs a chair, just come to the park. And then to, to back that up, we put a few flyers around the area of, you know, somebody that needs a wheelchair. Saturday morning, we'll be at the park. Just come to the park and we will give you a wheelchair. Now, I had my faith up that day, and we brought a hundred wheelchairs in a truck. I mean, this was all of my faith. I'm, you know, I thought maybe 30 were there, but just in case, we'll put a hundred in the truck. And we were not ready for the image we saw when 7,000 people showed up needing a wheelchair. Crawling, being carried in wheelbarrows on people's backs every way possible and you know you can cause a riot if you promise something and can't deliver it and and I just sat there and I said I had no idea well I don't know how I don't know what we're going to do but we'll find a way we're going to find a way to get these wheelchairs to you somebody on the team said well there's this guy over in Newport Beach you might call him and I'll tell the rest of the story in a minute but I did 
after that, I called him. I said, hey, we need some help. And he, and he goes, what do you need? And I said, wheelchairs. He goes, do you, could, you, could you handle a container? I said, absolutely. And, and how long would it take to get here? He says, well, I, I have a container right now. I'll send it your way. Later, I found out we were the very first wheelchair he passed out. So I'll tell the rest of that story in a minute, but a picture is worth a thousand words. So rather than tell you about our wheelchair ministry, let me show you a video of it. So, <laughs> to date, we have given away over 70,000 of these wheelchairs. <laughs> and the, the thing is, and I'll just mention this, if you look at the chair, people say it's kind of a funny looking chair, but you have no idea how practical it is. First of all, it's mountain bike tires, so... Uh, it does it roads in third world countries are uneven and they can go across uneven roads. You don't need a medical engineer to fix it. Any bike mechanic on the corner can repair it. And the plastic chair is practical because they can take a bath in it. So <laughs> it's just got some simple things to it. Now we've progressed on to a, what they call Gen 2 chair. And I want to go to show you a little story. I know I shared this last time, but about a year ago, I was invited to a special delivery. And it wasn't easy to do what we did. We had to fly a couple hours, and then we got in this truck. You'll see it going over some Andes Mountains Road, but we got into this truck and had to drive about eight hours into a little village, as they're finding the picture. Um, here we go, driving in this little truck uh, several hours into this little mountain village because there was a little girl there whose name was Floor. And as we got to the village, it was the first thing I did is we had a little Bible in the Quechua Indian dialect, which is the Indian dialect they speak. And it was a little solar powered tape recorder and they were able to listen to the Bible. So that created a tension. But then we got to down to business and we found this little girl, Floor. Now, Floor was the, one, the recipient of this special delivery wheelchair. And if you look up at her mom's hands, it says one million. Remember I said we gave away number one, the first chair? This was the one millionth chair this ministry has given away. 
And I say that for a reason, because little Flora, if you go to the other picture, you see the, the neighborhood she you know, lives in. Uh, no dirt roads, no easy way to get around. With her parents now able to move her and mobilize her in this little wheelchair. We are the ones that get the fun part. So you get to pack a shoebox with some toys. We get to watch the faces of the kids that open it up. Or we get, you know, other people that help get the chairs to us. We are the ones that get to see the joy of the parents and the neighbors that get to put that person in the chair and give them the gift of mobility. We call it take them out of the dirt, lift them into dignity in the hands of Jesus. So, um, just wanted to say, what you do really does make a difference. Uh, you can actually come down and be a part of it with us if you'd like to. Uh, your ch pastor's coming next month, and uh, we're thankful that people can help us do what we get to do. And your church is a big part of what we get to do. I want to read that verse in the book of Luke, chapter 17. Quick story uh, about Jesus. It says in Luke, chapter 17, verse 11, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them came back when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and praising God with a loud voice, he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. What an amazing story. To understand the, uh, the background of this story, if you remember, if you were called a leper, if you had leprosy, which could have been a series of skin diseases, and if the priest or the authorities in the city declared you to be leprous, you were no longer part of society. It was considered to be contagious, and people said, I don't want on me what you have on you. So because of that, if you were a leper, you now had to wear a special cloak, a special beggar's cloak, and you no longer had the dignity of living with your family or receiving a hug from your, your family members. You now had to live outside the gates of the city. When you came into the city, you had to proclaim with a loud voice, don't come near me unclean unclean because if somebody accidentally bumped into a leper and that leper didn't announce don't touch me I'm unclean that leper was to be taken out of the city and stoned because of the contagious nature of what leprosy was. And, and you can imagine the commotion as Jesus enters into a village and 10 lepers in this little group together are screaming, all of them at once, Jesus, we're unclean. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. And the Bible just says, Jesus said, go to the priest why? Because that's what you do when you're healed. Go to the priest. And on the way, the lepers noticed, we're healed, we're healed. And 10 lepers were healed. And then we come to that part where one turned around, came back, and said, thank you. Now, when I've taught this before, I've always thought about those ungrateful nine. Have you ever helped somebody and they didn't say thank you? Have you ever done something for somebody and they never took the time to come back? I mean, especially this. Here these men, are, they were given their life back, their dignity back, their future back. They can leave the beggar's cloak behind. They can go back to the family. They no longer had to scream out as they walked through the city, don't touch me, I'm unclean now. Their life, their future has come back and nine never even said thank you. Those ungrateful nine. 
Gratitude is a sign of relationship. And I don't know about you, but I want to be the one. Like Deanna's story a couple weeks ago, what a blessing to have that one come back and say, I received that box. You, you actually, when you hear this story, I received that box, or to have somebody like I get to come back this weekend and say, no, I, I actually give the boxes away, and they are such a blessing. Such a blessing. But nine didn't even come back and say thank you. I remember I was thinking about this verse a while back, and because something had happened, we get to help our church because we've been there for a while. We've been given certain graces by the government, and we help churches go farther, faster. That's what I call it. We can help them, some of their legal stuff and some other processes in church. We actually can help get visas for missionaries that come into Peru. And I just helped this group, this group of churches out. And uh, we had done a lot of work for them legally and with immigration. And after we helped them, instead of saying thanks, they actually turned around and kind of stung me. You ever had that happen? You just help somebody and they, then they start talking bad about you? And it was kind of hurt when they did this, this group of churches. It, it just kind of like, ah, oh, come on. I just helped you. Our church, we just did this. And now you're, you said, what? You're doing what? And Well, I have a mentor. You probably know who he is. His name is John Maxwell, the author. And uh, I had called John Maxwell. We had a mentoring program set up. And as I was going through this mentoring time, I, I get to, time to ask him questions. So I wanted to ask him, what do you do when you help people and they don't say thanks? In fact, they might even hurt you. What do you do? I was looking for some profound theological reason for vengeance. <laughs> I was really looking for something like, God, can I bless him with a brick kind of a verse? Or, you know, vengeance is mine, the Lord said so. Um, and what John Maxwell said on the phone was this, as I was bleeding, he said, Robert, people will be blessed because you're there. Just let them be. And then he went on to something else. I'm, wait, stay here a minute. I need to talk this out some more. But he was already off wanting to talk to me about something else that uh, he wanted to, to talk with me about. And, and I kept saying, no, come back. We never got back. All he said was, people will be blessed because you're there. Just let them be. And, you know, sometimes I'm a little slow. And a, a couple weeks later, I'm just thinking, you know, I really wanted to talk more about that. I really needed to talk more about that. And, and people will be blessed because you're there. And one of those early morning wake-up calls happened, and, or, you know, where the Holy Spirit just kind of woke me up, and it was like the light went on. I got it. People will be blessed. It's the story of the ten lepers. You see, in the story of the ten lepers, nine never came back to say thank you. But Jesus is God. Do you think he knew that some of them wouldn't say thank you? But he healed them anyway? He healed them anyway? And I started thinking, if all we do is help people that come back to say thank you, we're no better than the world. We're no better than the publicans and the sinners and, and the, the, the Pharisees who help those that can come back to say thank you. Jesus had to have known, being God, that he would touch people, bless people, even heal people that never took the time to come back and say thanks, but he did it anyway. So when you get the joy of having a Deanna come back to say thank you, remember she represents the hundreds of thousands or millions that never got the time or never the ability to come back and say thank you. But, or when we give the wheelchairs away, uh, there are so many people, little classrooms that raise up money for a wheelchair that we got to give away or uh, somebody took their lunch money, but they, they did something to help us give a wheelchair and we're the ones that get it. You see, even though the many people People never get the word of thanks doesn't mean don't do it. It means let's just do it anyway. Instead of thinking about the one leper that comes to say thank you, I want to be a 10 leper church. 
I want to be a church. You see, I believe that there is people in this city that are blessed because Coastline is here. They may never come into the church. They may never say thank you, but somehow they're blessed because this church is here. Somehow there's people in your neighborhood that are blessed because you are there. And I can say this from our point, for we are over in Peru and South America, we are blessed because of Coastline Church. Thank you. But there's a whole bunch of people that won't say thank you, but they're blessed. See, it's the 10 lepers. Now, I, I say this, and I want to end this with another story, because I, I, I remember, I, I think I mentioned a little about this last time as well, but I'll go a little deeper into this. Because one of the ministries our church has, it's called the Grace House. And the Grace House, it's, it's actually a beautiful place but it wasn't easy to do. In fact, it was really hard. It was hard, even the story of how it began was hard. You see, the story of the Grace House, it's we help young girls with eating disorders. And the reason we do this is when my daughter was young, she developed an eating disorder. She just kept getting skinnier and skinnier and me as a dad doing dad things, typical dad, girl, eat. I didn't know if you told a girl with anorexia or bulimia to eat, it ties her stomach into a knot and she can't. And my daughter was just getting thinner and she went into that dark place. She was cutting her wrists and cutting her arms and, and it was just a dark, dark place and we didn't know what to do, but she got very, very sick. Still remember the day I'd come to a pastor's conference just up the coast here at Saddleback. And while I was at that pastor's conference, I got that phone call that no dad wants to get. Your daughter is really sick. And sitting in Saddleback Church, I just happened to notice as I was looking at their church bulletin, they had a small group with girls with eating disorders. And I thought maybe they could help my daughter. We tried everything. We were looking everywhere. The only place we found was this little place in Arizona. But this place in Arizona cost $2,000 a day. And they we're missionaries. There's no way we could afford that. There's no way we could have paid that, but dads will do anything. They'll sell everything they have to, to help their daughters. We just, I couldn't even do that. So we said, God, you've got to do something. This girl, she's just wasting away. And, and she loved God. She just didn't love herself. And I, I remember when I got that phone call, I said, listen, send her on the plane. Whatever it takes, get her back to where we are now. And maybe somebody in this church can help us. And we got her finally to Los Angeles by a miracle. And I say by a miracle because when she showed up at the airport the first night, they wouldn't let her on the plane without a doctor's certificate. So I called a friend of mine who's a doctor. I said, please make a certificate. And we got her to LA and, and we, they just said at the church, well, here's a Christian psychologist. Maybe she can help you. And we went through a year of hell. My daughter actually lived, lived here with my wife, and I was traveling back and forth from the church in Peru. And, and that year of hell, my daughter stayed in that dark place, and we couldn't get her out of it. The psychiatrist, as much as she tried, she couldn't get her out of it. And it was just this moment where it was just a hard, hard year. And then we heard about something that Hillsong Church, through Darlene Check, the, the singer, had a ministry to girls with eating disorders. And we had a friend that knew her, so we called her and we just said, can you help her? Can you help my daughter? And they, she said, yes, maybe we can send her. So we, we sent our daughter, and it wasn't easy. The only way I convinced her to go is she might learn the Australian accent. So we got her to go and... The thing is, is after the end of that year in Hillsong, God gave us our daughter back. Amen. Totally healed. <laughs> it was through the church and through this ministry that Darlene had to reach out to girls that were with these eating disorders. And, and, and that was a year here now and a year in Australia. Well, you know, Christians sometimes are mean. Not in Coastline. I'm talking about the other church, okay? <laughs> you ever notice that, that sometimes Christians are mean? I had a few in my church, and during that two-year span that she was gone, 
you know, we were protecting her privacy. We really didn't want to say what she was going through. But, you know, people started saying things like, well, pastor's daughter must be pregnant. He's hiding her and, you know, something's going on. And I just said, no, 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 it's not that. Just, you know, pray with us. She's got a health issue. Just pray with us. And and finally, when my daughter came back, it was so beautiful to see her worship God and have her back as this beautiful little girl. And, and I remember we had a conference, a pastor's conference, and she looked at me. She goes, Dad, I'm ready to tell my story. And I said, really? And she said, yes, I'm ready to tell this story. And I said, okay. So we got her up, and she told the story of how she had gone through this dark place and how God had healed her. I forgot that we were live on the radio. The next day, we had hundreds of phone calls. Mom's calling us, girls calling us, my daughter, can you help us? Can you help us? And, and all of a sudden, I woke up to this realization, this is an issue in third world countries? Why is this an issue in a country that's so poor they can't afford, afford food? And then I found out the reason why. It's because of sexual abuse. When a girl is sexually abused as a child, she can't control her body. She will control one thing she can control. And that's when we found out the news that no dad wants to hear. My daughter was sexually abused by a neighbor. We can't change the history, but we can change the future. I, the past, sometimes people go through paths that are hard and we have an enemy out there and the enemy attacks in so many different ways. We can't do that, but through the power of grace. So we, we just said, God, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. Well, we opened this place called the Grace House. Now, it wasn't easy. The Grace House actually was very hard. It took us years, actually eight years, just to build it. It was way more expensive than I thought, much more time than I thought. Getting the permits were way harder than I thought. But And this is a picture of the Grace House. They'll put it up now. When we finally finished the Grace House, we were ready. It was done. We said, okay, let's, let's now bring the girls in. The very first girl to walk in, her name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth had gone through the eating disorders, was actually in. This is a picture of Elizabeth. I'll tell her story now. She was actually in a government home and was abused in that home. And when, when somebody said, there's another house you can go to, she said, no way. And they said, no, this is a Christian home. And she said, I don't care. I don't want to go. And they said, you can leave anytime you want. And she said, if I don't like it, I can leave. Yes, okay, I'll try it. And when Elizabeth walked in the doors, her first words were, I didn't know God loved me this much. She graduated. She's doing amazing now. And the thing is this, just because it's hard doesn't mean don't do it. It means do it anyway. Sometimes it's hard. You see, it was hard to build. It was expensive to build. It took us long. And we, when the girls come in there, we don't charge them anything. They're not there because mom and dad have money. They are there because Jesus loves them. And that's the healing process. It's a faith-based thing where they come there and they go through this process of healing. And when she walked out of there, she's now getting married soon. She's got a beautiful life ahead of her. You see, it's hard, but it doesn't mean don't do it. Those shoe boxes, you, you think it's hard to pack them. Try to get them out of customs. When the customs agent says, how am I going to look in each one of these boxes on that container to make sure it's just a toy in there? Or to get them into a warehouse and to find the churches, divide them out, boy, girl, by the names, and, and get them to that village that's two days away in a, in a car ride and, and to find those kids. But you see, just because it's hard doesn't mean don't do it. It means do it anyway. Amen? You see, sometimes we look for easy. And if you listen to Deanna's story that was here just two weeks ago, I can only imagine how hard it was to get that in a, in a Muslim country to a Christian church, those boxes. It must have been hard, but it was worth it. You see, the cross was hard, but it was worth it. And sometimes we look for easy. We want easy. But if it's hard, doesn't mean stop. It just means do it anyway. Ten lepers 
one came back. But you know, for every one that you get to hear from, there were nine others that went home praising God. Went home saying the most amazing thing happened today. I've got my life back. Look what God did. So let's be a 10 leper church. Amen. Instead of worrying about the ones that come back to say thank you. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for this church that is concerned not only about Carlsbad and this part of the world, but they're also looking beyond to see what else they can do to help other places. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.